Der Krieg ist eine Katastrophe für die Ukraine. Aber der Krieg wird sich auch als Katastrophe für Russland erweisen. Von nun an, Jahr für Jahr, mehr als zwei Prozent des Bruttoinlandsprodukts in unsere Verteidigung investieren. Paying close to one percent, and they're supposed to be paying two percent. And the United States, over the years, got to a point where it's paying 4.3 percent, which is very unfair. So we're paying for a big proportion of NATO, which basically is protecting Europe. For many years, critics have been quick to point out that the United States appears to bear a heavy share of the defense burden within NATO, while other members appear to free ride and take advantage of U.S. military power. And in light of the recent war in Ukraine, new tensions are emerging over differing positions on burden sharing and the deployment of armament. So when push comes to shove, are EU member states like Germany freeloading off the American military? Or is there something deeper going on? I would imagine that if you were to ask any American off the street, what do you know about the German military? You would probably get an answer that would fall into one of two categories. World War II, which happened 80 years ago, and NATO which thankfully is more contemporary, but to be fair, the general population's understanding of NATO and the US-German alliance is also pretty shaky. And I do think it's a shame that more people aren't really aware of what NATO is, how it works, or even just what the relationship is like between the US and Germany, because by all accounts, for a couple of generations now, we've had a pretty symbiotic relationship with one another. So while it's not always been pretty, or perfect or fair, depending on who you ask, especially with recent geopolitical events, I thought it would be interesting to look at this US-German alliance under the lens of NATO. How we got here, where we are today, what is burden sharing, and ultimately, does Germany pay its fair share? Yeah, it's a heavy topic. So without further ado, let's get started. The US and German military relationship has been shaped for decades under the framework of NATO. It was the alliance that protected the free part of Germany against the threat of Soviet invasion. The historical success of the alliance contributed to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it was particularly the US that supported the unification of Germany as well as the creation of a Europe that was whole and free. And the long-standing presence of hundreds of thousands of allied troops and their families have really created a special relationship between our countries, in particular between the German and the American people. So in very much a tangible way, these relationships have really formed a transatlantic bond in a very human dimension. So how did we go from this to this in just a span of 80 years? What is NATO and what role does it serve? You know, it's often said that NATO was founded under the threat of Soviet invasion. And truth be told, that's really only partially true. In fact, the Alliance's creation was part of a broader effort to serve three purposes, deterring Soviet expansionism, forbidding the revival of nationalist militarism in Europe through a strong North American presence on the continent, and encouraging European political integration. The aftermath of World War II saw much of Europe devastated in a way that might be difficult to really envision. Approximately 36 and a half million Europeans had died in the conflict. 19 million of them were civilians. Refugee camps and rationing dominated daily life, and in some areas, infant mortality rates were one in four. In the German city of Hamburg alone, half a million people were homeless. In addition, communists aided by the Soviet Union were threatening elected governments across Europe. In February 1948, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, with covert backing from the Soviet Union, overthrew the democratically elected government in that country. 
Then, in reaction to the democratic consolidation of West Germany, the Soviets blockaded Allied-controlled West Berlin in a bid to consolidate their hold on the German capital. Fortunately, by then, the US had turned its back on its traditional policy of diplomatic isolationism. Aid provided through the US-funded Marshall Plan, also known as the European Recovery Program, and other measures fostered a degree of economic stabilization. European states still needed confidence in their security. However, before they would begin talking and trading with one another, it was clear that military cooperation and the security that it would bring would have to develop in parallel with economic and political progress. So in 1949, NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was formed and was originally an alliance of 12 founding members, the United States, the United Kingdom, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, and Portugal. Over time, this has been expanded to include over 30 members, with the most recent additions of Montenegro in 2017 and North Macedonia in 2020. Sweden and Finland applied to join NATO just last year and have completed accession talks. So far, their applications have been ratified by 28 of NATO's 30 countries. And really, this alliance was founded on an idea of collective defense, and the idea that an attack on one member state was considered an attack on the alliance as a whole, as outlined in Article 5 of the treaty. Article 5 has interestingly only been invoked once by the United States in the wake of the 9-11 attacks in 2001. But collective defense stipulates that each member state must also contribute a significant number of resources to their military, and thus these contributions would ensure that all members of the alliance would be capable of coming to the defense of their allies. But I don't wanna to get too ahead of myself here. I'm going to talk about spending in terms of defense and the military a little bit later on in this video. Okay, so without diving into an entire lesson in European military history, I'm going to begin from the very basic point in saying that, you know, after World War II, Germany was very much occupied by the United States. And even today, depending on who you ask and how you frame the word occupy, well, it's still kind of happening in a way today. Because yes, while technically it was on May 5th, 1955, when the Allied nations issued a proclamation declaring an end to the military occupation of West Germany, the military occupation of the American sector of West Berlin continued until October 2nd, 1990. And even today, for many Germans, it doesn't necessarily feel like the word occupy should be put in the past tense. Because the thing is, I would bet that most Americans, especially Americans who have never lived abroad, have very little comprehension for what it feels like to have foreign military bases quite literally in your own backyard. In the US, you don't just see whole towns and cities built around and for foreign families. Towns where the rents are paid for by foreign governments, the foreign families drive their own foreign cars brought over for free, where they shop on base to avoid paying local taxes and actually pay income tax to a foreign country. But yet that is the case for modern Germans living in Germany today, living in kind of this symbiotic relationship with the American military and their families right here in Germany. Because today, Germany is the hub for the US military deployments to everywhere in Europe and beyond. For deterrence and defense against Russia, Germany is the main access point for deployment of forces from North America. Germany is also the starting point for rational deployment to Poland of the US Armored Brigade Combat Team, as well as for enablers in peacetime. And any potential future reinforcement from the US and Canada to Europe in a crisis and in war. For crisis response outside of Europe, Germany is also the strategic hub for US power projection to the Middle East and in North Africa, and for the provision of logistic support for ongoing US operations, for example, in Afghanistan. Plus, Rammstein Air Base is not only the air command of NATO command structure, 
and one of three component commands reporting to SACUR. It's also the largest US airbase and logistics hub in Europe and its strategic periphery. So it's probably not so surprising then that Germany is actually home to the largest US presence of troops in Europe. Although it should be mentioned that those numbers have actually been on the decline. German government figures show that between 2006 and 2018, the number of US troops stationed in Germany more than halved from 72,400 to 33,250 as the US military responded to a shifting and increasingly complex global security situation. But having such power, influence, and access in somebody else's home costs you something, whether that's in direct cash flow or through military protection. So while over the last 10 years, the German federal government has actually spent almost a billion euros on the stationing of US troops in Germany, According to a 2020 report from the Ministry of Finance, the US Department of Defense estimated that spending in Germany in 2020 alone came to $8.125 billion, 61 times as much. So yes, while many Americans would probably be quite shocked just to understand fully how much money is spent by the American government on defense in Europe, it's also important to understand that the US isn't just spending that money on European defense because it's the right thing to do. It's because we want something in return. And the US military constantly performs cost benefit assessments and adjusts spending and boots on the ground in Germany, depending on how much of that benefit they determine that they require. But in the meantime, Germany actually does get something in return as well. And yes, part of that is military protection, but there are also other indirect financial benefits as well, because American soldiers are generally pretty well paid and spend a lot of their money in Germany. The latest study that investigated the economic impact of US bases in Germany was eight years ago, but its conclusions are still pretty interesting. At that time, it was estimated that the presence of US troops in Germany would generate an economic power of $2.347 billion, or $1.123 billion in salaries that remain in the region, $400 million in construction services, materials, and equipment, and another $824 million in value added through indirectly created jobs. Again, it's important to look at this as a relationship, and as long as both sides see mutual benefit, it continues today. You know, is NATO fair is a fascinating question, to which I would follow up with, fair to whom and fair when. Because like any relationship, expecting burden sharing to be equal 100% of the time is ludicrous. You have to really look at long-term trajectories and also take into consideration things like risk, investment, and strategic power. But there are many, many people, people who are much more educated in military strategy and finance than I am, who really do feel like in terms of burden sharing, things have been pretty unfair for quite a while now. Specific to Germany, they haven't always been satisfied with the German approach to sharing common risks and responsibilities and operations, especially when Germany is expected to take the same risks as other allies do and go kinetic and participate in high-end operations, such as in times of war and crisis just like what we're facing right now. And there are real fears among scholars and military experts that as Russia continues its military buildup along Ukraine's borders, NATO and the EU need to project a strong united front on these extraordinary and dangerous developments. But in their eyes, Germany is undermining that unity, leaving the West weaker and more divided because of it. When discussing burden sharing, many Americans will likely point to the goal set in 2006. Every NATO nation must take the defensive, must make the defensive investments necessary. Where they agreed to commit a minimum of 2% of their gross domestic product to defense spending. 
and 20% of the annual defense expenditure on major new equipment by 2024. Now, the combined wealth of the non-US allies measured in GDP is almost equal to that of the United States. However, non-US allies together spent less than half of what the US spends on defense. And this imbalance has been a contrast with variations throughout the history of the alliance, and more so since the tragic events of September 11th, after which the US significantly increased its defense spending. The effects of the 2007-2008 financial crisis and the declining share of resources devoted to defense in many allied countries up to 2014 have exacerbated this imbalance and also revealed growing asymmetries in capability among European allies. France, Germany, and the United Kingdom together represent approximately 50% of non-US allies' defense spending. Now, in 2014, only three allies spent 2% of GDP or more on defense. This went up to nine allies in the first half of 2022. Plus, 2022 is actually the eighth consecutive year of rising defense spending across European allies in Canada, amounting to a rise of 1.2% in real terms compared to 2021. That being said, the US is still by far the biggest contributor in terms of spending to NATO. So although Germany did commit to meeting that 2% NATO spending, in fact, even going so far as to set up a 100 billion euro special fund in order to meet military spending goals. The German Economic Institute, a Cologne-based think tank, said that Berlin isn't on course to hit the 2% benchmark in 2024, and government spending will continue to come just below target until 2027. So what's stopping Germany from spending more on its military? Well, it turns out quite a lot. In June of last year, Germany's Bundestag, the lower house of parliament, approved the creation of the 100 billion euro special defense fund that Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And this is a big deal because that special fund was specifically designed to bypass Germany's constitutionally enshrined debt break. That's right, enshrined in Articles 109 and 115 of the German Grundgesetz since 2009 has limited the federal government's structural, i.e. cyclically adjusted deficit to just 0.35% of GDP since the fiscal year 2016. And this inclusion in Germany's basic law or constitution of stringent limits on sovereign debt has actually been argued to enhance the country's credibility on the financial markets, leading to lower risk premiums and hence easier public sector financing. And you know, really, it cannot be understated just how differently politicians between the US and Germany approach spending. American politicians like to woo voters by promising to lavish them with cash and investing in projects that are popular with their base. But here in Germany, they curry favor by pledging fiscal rectitude. So yeah, I do find it a little bit ironic when I hear Americans who are, you know, bashing Germany for not spending more when quite literally this was the headline that was dominating the US news just last week. With the United States debt limit officially being reached. Unimaginable, a cataclysmic event. The United States could go into default by June and that would be an economic disaster. So in the end, here in Germany, political commitments which rule out tax hikes or cuts elsewhere while upholding the debt break in its current form is probably going to remain too restrictive for Germany to meet its defense spending commitments. But here's the thing, when you assess burden sharing, it's really so much more complex than just simply looking at spending on things like troops and technology. Because like I said before, NATO is an intricate alliance based on the concept of collective action, 
a concept which aims to maximize defense capabilities in a wartime scenario. And there's also this idea that how that money is spent actually does level the playing field in different ways. It's no secret that war is big business in the United States. In fact, military spending involves a massive redistribution of wealth from the public to the private sector. It's why there's over 700 lobbyists representing for-profit military contractors in Washington, D.C. And since 2002, the majority of Pentagon funding goes to for-profit companies, which means that last year, the military industry got roughly $405 billion from the Biden administration's military budget. And such a massive output of defense spending by the U.S., ultimately means that they also incur pretty lucrative financial benefits in the U.S. as well. The expansion of the defense industry provides jobs and further stimulates the U.S. economy and is essentially a good that other nations don't necessarily benefit from in the same way or to the same extent. As you can see from this chart, the U.S. holds by far the largest market share of the leading exporters of major weapons between 2017 and 2021 by country, with Germany holding just roughly 4.5%. So yes, the U.S. does spend a lot on defense, and as a result, they spend a lot on defense in Europe and in NATO. But the U.S. also makes a lot of money off of that spending as well. So for a fair and balanced comparison, you, you do have to take that into account. Now, the last point I'd like to make in this video probably sounds pretty obvious, but truly, when you're talking about burden, and cost sharing, you, you do have to look at things outside of spending because history, context, and circumstances really are everything. And at the end of the day, going to war means very different things for Germans than it does for Americans. War for Americans is something that happens somewhere else. I mean, come on, the last significant military engagement on U.S. soil was in 1890 at the Battle of Wounded Knee. And for all intents and purposes, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans really do sort of act like this geographical security blanket that we often take for granted. Although the Cold War certainly gave us a scare, the only real portrait of what we have seen of what an invasion of the continental U.S. would look like comes from Hollywood. But for Germany, the security picture is quite a bit more complicated. As a member of NATO, German authorities have to maintain alliance solidarity in the geopolitical competition between the U.S. and Russia. And at the same time, Germany has cooperated extensively with Russia in the past, in part due to a strategy of what has been coined Wandel durch Handel, or change through trade. The most basic principle of which says that perhaps the best way forward with diplomacy is not to exclude someone from the trading table, but to give them investments and financial relationships that can act as a mutual benefit for future diplomatic action. And listen, I'm not here to say whether or not this strategy is right or wrong. As you can imagine, particularly around the subject of energy, this has kind of backfired pretty spectacularly and gives quite a bit of weight to the historic skepticism of the German strategy from Poland and the U.S. But there are real conflicting security policy interests that are reflected in Germany's relatively low defense investments and their strategy when sending aid to Ukraine. It's not easy. There's a lot of history there. <laughs> and honestly, this is a debate that has been going on on the international stage for decades now. And we wouldn't still be continuing today if we had the answers. And you probably wouldn't have just sat through a YouTube video trying to break it down. So, you know, at the end of the day, 
it's it's not my job to tell you how to think or feel about these issues, but hopefully at this point in the video, maybe it's a little enlightening to look at some of these dimensions and begin to kind of understand just how complicated international relations are. I mean, the leadership within NATO right now is tasked with a pretty complex decision to make. Should NATO react more strongly in the hopes that Russia will back down? Or will such a show of force only open Pandora's box and lead to a much larger war beyond Ukraine's borders? Should they move forward with letting Ukraine into NATO? And how much aid and support do they give to Ukraine? And what does that timeline even look like? There are a lot of layers here and the stakes are very high. So I think this is probably a good point to end this video today and just kind of ask you guys down in the comments about what are your thoughts and feelings about NATO, about the current geopolitical crisis and war, or even just about the military cooperation and history between the US and Germany, because even that outside of war is a pretty complex thing. And again, there are many dimensions here. So I would imagine that I, although try to be as comprehensive as possible, there are still things that factor into this relationship that I might have left out. And if you have something that you would like to share that gives better perspective, please let me know down in the comments below. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Cheers.